second time. I call the Deputy Opposition Leader and Member for Sydney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This is a budget of broken promises. It's a bad budget for Australia and it's a bad budget for Australians. The broken promises of this budget reveal a government with a serious deficit, a values deficit. Mm. The budget's broken promises will hit low and middle income families and the elderly. The poorest will suffer the most, but everyone suffers. Before the election, the Prime Minister said there'd be no cuts to education, no cuts to health, no change to pensions, no change to the GST and no cuts to the ABC or SBS. Every single one of those promises broken in this budget. Australians expect their government to run a strong economy, but that's just the start of what we expect. We expect a government to have a vision for the future of our country and a plan to get there. Australians value our egalitarian society. We want a society where hard work is rewarded, but where a little bit of bad luck doesn't mean the end of the world, a society where no one is left behind. This budget fails that fairness test. It hits the poorest the hardest. It makes life harder for millions of ordinary Australians struggling to balance their family budget. This budget makes it harder for people when they fill up at the petrol pump, when they go to the doctor, when they buy medicines. And for that reason, Labor will fight the unfair measures in this budget every step of the way. The budget shows how starkly the differences between the two sides of politics play out. What kind of government would deliver a budget that will reduce the income of a couple with a combined income of $95,000 and two kids by almost $5,000 a year? How do those members go back to their electorates and exactly. tell that family that this government is taking $5,000 a year from them? What kind of government would deliver a budget that will reduce the income of a sole parent earning $55,000 a year with two kids by $6,000 a year. These aren't our numbers. These are figures provided by NatSem. What's really surprised me, though, about the public anger in response to this budget is that people aren't just angry about the broken promises and attack on their own family budgets. They're angry about what's happening to other people. Mm -hmm. Parents with young kids who've lost family tax benefit and the school kids bonus, um, they're not just talking to me about their family budget, they're talking to me about how unfair it is that pensioners who've worked hard all their lives are being told that their pensions will be cut. Mm. Pensioners who've never had a chance to go to university themselves are talking to me about their grandkids, not even their own grandkids, but kids that age who now have to choose between getting a decent university education and buying a home of their own one day. Young Australians who are set to be slugged with these mind-boggling student debts, of course they're talking to me about how it makes the decision to go to university much harder, but that's not all they're talking to me about. They're concerned about the $7.6 billion that this government's cutting from the aid budget, cuts made on the back of the world's poorest. Here, here the member up there says, cuts made on the back of the world's poorest. And uh, those young people are concerned too about the cuts to the climate change programs that would uh, mean Australia uh, was contributing to reducing the likelihood of global warming, uh, um, passing that uh, critical two degrees um, benchmark that scientists tell us is so important. So despite what the Treasurer says, the, the angry reaction to this budget is not because Australians are selfish. It's the exact yeah, opposite. Exactly. Of course they're concerned for their own family budgets, but they're concerned for all of the people who are hit hardest by this budget. They don't want to see Australia become a two-tiered system, a user pays American style, you're fine if you're wealthy, but God help you if you're not style system. Uh, a system that condemns kids who are born poor to grow up poor, to, to be um, sent to school in second-rate schools, a, a health system that is world-class if you're wealthy and unattainable if you're not, 
Australians don't want a society of haves and have-nots. They value our way of life, and that's why, yes, they want a strong economy, but they want a fair society too, and this budget fails on both counts. I've had so many individual constituents stop me in the street, talk to me about the, um, the uh, issues that will affect them. Uh, uh, hundreds of little changes as they come out over coming days and weeks that will really impact a woman with cerebral palsy who's managed to get back into the workforce uh, with the help of the disability support pension, terrified about what the changes mean for her in the future. A 23-year-old who's been saving up for his first home using the First Home Saver account, again, uh, says he says he feels cheated that this scheme's been cut. And what's actually really scary about this is it's not clear whether the members opposite really know what this budget is doing. We've had the Prime Minister say on Melbourne oh, you'd think the Prime Minister would know. Prime Minister say like on it. Melbourne Radio recently <laughs> that an average person would only have to pay the seven dollar GP co payment the first ten times they went to a doctor. Uh uh. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, there is a safety net for people on, who are concession card holders and uh, kids, but there's um, not that safety net for ordinary working people. So, you know, mum That's and dad, right. yeah, family yeah, budget under pressure, really you know, who, who won't be going to the doctor. Minister for Education, you'd think he'd know, uh -uh. said that the new arrangements for hex debts and deregulated fees apply only to students enrolling new students from the 1st of January 2016. Um, but it seems like the budget papers say the changes apply to all students enrolling from the 14th of May 2014 who will be studying in January 2016 and to all people with a current HEX or HELP debt. And it's not very reassuring, is it, that the, the cuts are so deep and so brutal, but the people who are supposed to be coming up with them and implementing them don't actually understand them. As well as the values deficit, the economic arguments of this budget just don't stack up. The, the coalition's hysteria is built on a confected budget emergency. They hope that if they say often enough that, that, that you know, the end is nigh, people will come to believe it. And the most astonishing thing, given this uh, hysteria around the confected budget emergency, is that they've actually managed to deliver bigger deficits. Um, they've done a deal with the Greens for Debt Unlimited and the deficits in the first three years from 2014-15 are actually larger than the ones that were predicted in the pre-election fiscal outlook, the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook statement that is prepared not by us but by Treasury and Finance before the election. Um, it's worth reminding people that this uh, pre-election economic and fiscal outlook is a Peter Costello Charter of Budget Honesty innovation and sets the benchmark for um, each party's election commitments going into the election. So why has that happened? Because they've added $68 billion to the deficit in just a few months um, by giving, of course, uh, almost $9 billion unasked for and unneeded to the Reserve Bank by changing a number of economic parameters. And of course, spending. I mean, there's a budget emergency, so what should we do? We should find $22 billion for a gold-plated paid parental leave scheme just shows how wrong the priorities of this budget are. Pensioners who are surviving on around $20,000 a year get a cut, so people who are earning 200, 300, 400, a million dollars a year can get $50,000 to have a baby. Now you cut super support, superannuation support for low and middle income workers so that you can leave in place measures that allow the highest income workers to benefit most from super tax concessions. We back petrol taxes that hit everyone who drives but hit those living in outer yes. suburbs and in That's regional right. areas the worst. We're going to hit them with petrol taxes um, and then float the notion of a, a higher or broader GST at the same time as knocking back uh, corporate tax avoidance and profit shifting yeah. measures that would have raised $1.1 billion. How on earth can anyone justify these priorities? And of course, then the abolition of the carbon tax and the minerals resources rent tax in favour of taxes that hit the family budget. There's the $80 billion cut from education and health. I, I always knew that the government, many on those uh, benches opposite, were big supporters of outsourcing. Well, they've really, they've really done well. In this instance, they've outsourced $80 billion of hospital and education cuts to the states. They're not prepared to do it themselves, 
They've just snatched that money from the states. It is extraordinary uh, to just say, well, the, the states can deal with it. This thing that's always been a shared responsibility, no longer a shared responsibility, we're just going to shove that onto the states and they can deal with the uh, longer waiting lists for elective surgery and they can deal with the longer waiting times in emergency departments and they can deal with the cuts to our schools. We met um, the budget rule of keeping real average spending growth to less than 2 per cent in a year, the lowest four-year result in 23 years. Uh, we saved 200,000 jobs during the global financial crisis. We prevented <coughs> Australia from falling into recession. Uh, and we did it in a way that saw Australia coming um, back to surplus over the economic cycle because we agree that it is important that over time we do that. We delivered $180 billion in savings while we were in government. Uh, in fact, as health minister, I delivered billions of dollars in savings, but I did it by means testing the private health insurance rebate, opposed by those opposite, and I found it by uh, finding savings in the cost of generic medicines, by paying less for medicines as they came off patent. Billions of dollars of savings opposed by that, those opposite. The government's cuts to the health budget make no sense. Why would you cut prevention programs uh, if you want to keep people um, out of hospital, where it's expensive to look after them? Why cut prevention when the greatest health challenges, smoking, obesity and excessive alcohol consumption, cost us so much as a community? How does it make sense to cut health costs by reducing access to the cheapest part of the health system, general practice, knowing that the outcome are sicker people and more strain on the hospital system. These are health cuts designed by someone who doesn't care about patients, just about short-term cuts, but they will cost us all in the long run. You can, cost, you can cut costs in the health system by keeping people healthy and out of hospital, or you can cut costs by rationing the access that sick people have to medical treatment. Guess which this government has chosen. Um, I spoke earlier today about the massive cuts to foreign aid and what they'll mean to the world's poorest people. And uh, I think it's so important to say that, um, again, that's a stark example of just how different our values are. John Howard knew that Australia should um, be a, a, a nation of uh, lifters, not leaners, when it came to international development assistance. Uh, John Howard knew that, but Tony Abbott does not. And it's worth um, saying also that if you're talking about our role in the world community, uh, nations everywhere are looking at us now and saying, why are you cutting an effective and cost-effective program to reduce air pollution, carbon pollution? Uh, why are you cutting, for example, billions of dollars from environmental programs while finding $2.6 billion to pay big polluters to keep polluting? Why are you cutting from grassroots environmental programs, the CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, uh, renewable energy initiatives, um, uh, a broken promise on land care funding, ripping $483 million out of land care and conservation programs, um, at the at 2.8 million from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, uh, scrapping climate change research across government agencies, and of course um, uh, abolishing uh, um, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation that actually makes money for the government. Why are you doing um, uh, these things we're asked by the world community at a time when everybody else is moving in the other direction, moving to tackle climate change. Uh, another broken promise um, on land care and uh, another broken promise, of course, on the ABC and SBS. $43.5 million over four years from ABC and SBS and a cut of almost $200 million to the Australian network. This is a budget of broken promises. It is a budget of wrong priorities. It is a budget that hurts the poorest the most. It is a budget that shows very clearly the values deficit of this government.